uh, welcome the next speaker, Ilva Lindberg, who is a member of the Council on Ethics for the Norwegian Government Pension Fund. She is also uh, the founder and uh, managing director of the consulting company Sigla. Um, and she also works at the University of Cambridge program uh, for sustainability leadership. She has uh, uh, broad experience in the area of consulting, uh, corporate and strategy uh, development, corporate uh, responsibility and marketing with a focus on uh, Scandinavia and Russia. So Ilva, please, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the introduction. Спасибо вам большое. Я очень рада быть здесь с вами сегодня. Я немножко говорю по-русски, но эта презентация будет на английском. Но я стараюсь немножко говорить. Когда будут вопросы, мы посмотрим, сколько я буду понимать и сколько надо делать на английском. Хорошо? Отлично. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be with you today and for your interest in the work of the Council on Ethics of the Norwegian, Norwegian Government Pension Fund. Uh, what I want to try to do today is to tell you a bit about the fund in brief. I, I know that you have already been introduced to quite a lot of the work of the fund through a meeting in uh, Norges Bank. So this will be a brief section. I, I'll then uh, tell you in quite some detail about the ethical guidelines of the fund, how they were developed, uh, what they are and what they mean. And then perhaps the most interesting part will be when we look at specific examples of companies that the council has looked at. The presentation will be quite brief uh, and that is on purpose because I would like to leave quite a lot of time for questions and discussion. So this you probably know already. The Norwegian Government Pension Fund Global invests in almost 9,000 companies in more than 82 countries. And it has a market value of more than 70, $750 billion. Uh, you probably had an updated figure on this yesterday. This is as of December last year. The fund invests in shares, bonds and real estate. If we look at the ethical obligations of the fund, uh, the Graver Commission was a commission set down by the Norwegian Parliament to look at how the fund could take ethical concerns into consideration. And the conclusions of this commission when it came to the ethical side of things was firstly, that future generations should benefit from the petroleum wealth which had an implication that the fund should achieve a solid return in the long run. And secondly, that the fund should respect the fundamental rights of those who are affected by the companies in which the fund invests. The fund obviously does not very directly impact many lives, but through the companies in which it invests, given that it invests in more than 8,000 companies in 82 countries, it impacts a huge number of lives. The consequence of this was that the fund should avoid being invested in companies that are or will be complicit in grossly unethical activities. So whereas the first is really a more of a financial obligation to Norwegians, if you will. The second is an ethical obligation. This you probably heard in some more detail in your visit to the bank. Uh, this is the strategic benchmark index of the fund. So 60% invested in global equities, 
35 to 40 percent in bonds and between zero and five percent, so up to five percent in global real estate. And each of these asset classes has its own index provider. So if we look at the tools that the fund can use as a responsible investors, what are these? Firstly, it's voting. So the fund can vote at annual general meetings of the companies in which it's invested. The second is engagement. So entering into a dialogue with companies about issues or themes or happenings that are of particular relevance to the fund as an owner. Another option is litigation. In other words, taking companies to court, which is not used very often. Shareholder resolutions, which is when uh, shareholder resolutions are brought forward to the annual general meeting, put to the AGM and the AGM votes on it. The fund can either promote resolutions on its own, take the initiative to do so, or support shareholder resolutions promoted by others. And this follows on to the next point, cooperation with other investors. The fund does not have to do this on its own. It can collaborate with other large investors. And the more investors are engaging on a particular issue, the more power this will get in the dialogue with the company, the greater influence you will have with the company. Industry initiatives, if there are certain industries with our particular issues that are relevant, the fund can focus on that industry. Uh, one example here, which we'll get back to, is child labor in cotton seeds production, where uh, the fund has taken a stance on this particular industry. Improvement of market standards, so attempting to improve not just a case for a single company, but trying to raise the standard across the board for several companies, for example, within a given sector. Then we have communication and expectation documents where the fund does some thorough analysis and communicates to the companies that this is what we expect from you. These are the standards that we expect you to uphold. So the companies know what the fund is thinking and expecting on a particular issue. And then what we'll talk about today, which is exclusion or observation of individual companies. So this is the governance structure. Uh, the Ministry of Finance, they're responsible for the general framework and they make decisions on exclusion and observation. Norges Bank, they, as you now well know, uh, are responsible for the exercise of ownership rights, the engagement and active ownership. And then to your far right, you have the Council on Ethics. Our responsibility is to analyze and bring forward recommendations on exclusions or observations from the fund. Now, you may have been told that this governance structure is going to change in the future uh, because we had recommendations put forward by a strategy council to the Ministry of Finance recommending some quite fundamental changes to how this is organized and set up. Uh, this was then taken to the Parliament, uh, and by early next year, we will know what kind of changes we get in this setup. So this is the Council on Ethics. Uh, we're an independent council, so we don't we give recommendations, but we don't report to anyone. And we are there as members in our own right, not as representatives of any particular organization. Uh, our leader is Professor Mesta, who's over here. He's a professor of law. And uh, the others have competence from uh, company boards, uh, mainstream business, law, environmental issues, and consulting and academia. Uh, we have a secretariat that works full time with eight people. Uh, and we meet monthly, approximately. And uh, we don't see one case just once. Cases are presented quite a number of times before we make a decision. 
And I will get into this in a bit more detail, but typically we are involved in quite a long process where we get a first idea of a company that may be a case for exclusion. And then the secretariat works to find analysis, they have consultants, maybe they do field surveys and so on. So it's quite a lengthy process. It's not that we get a company case and they will say, yes, it's in or no, it's out. That's not how it works. So the guidelines for exclusion and observation. Exclusion for the investment universe is either product-based or it's conduct-based. And I'll tell you more in detail what that means. When it comes to products, we've excluded about 40 companies. When it comes to conduct, we've excluded about 20 some companies. And when it comes to the exclusion of products, these are typically production of weapons that violate fundamental humanitarian principles through their normal use, production of tobacco, specifically excluded, and the sale of weapons or military material to certain states. And currently that is Burma or Myanmar. When it comes to conduct, the following points are our guidelines for exclusion. If there are serious or systematic violations of human rights, if there are serious violations of the rights of individuals in situations of war or conflict, severe environmental damage, gross corruption, or other particularly serious violations of fundamental ethical norms. So you can see it covers human rights, environmental damage, corruption, and then there's a point at the end for anything else that's quite serious but not covered by the other points above. So exclusion based on products. Um, this is just an extract from the actual guidelines of what I just said. So if you'd like to look at the guidelines and find the paragraphs, <laughs> this is where you find them. And you can read in a lot more detail about this as well. So some examples of products that are excluded. Um, chemical weapons, biological and bacteriological weapons. Certain conventional weapons like blinding lasers and non-detectable fragments. Anti-personnel mines, cluster munitions, nuclear weapons, and then again tobacco. This is an overview of the number of companies that we've excluded based on these product-based criteria. And as you can see, the production of tobacco has by far the most with 21 companies, and then nuclear weapons coming in at second with 12 companies. And you can find all the details about these cases on the website for the Council on Ethics. And they're quite lengthy recommendations as well, quite thorough, quite detailed, uh, and so you'll find all the nitty gritty on the website for each individual exclusion, if that's interesting. So that was the product based exclusions. If we move on to conduct, um, this just says in a bit more detail what the conduct based exclusions are about. So serious or systematic human rights violations, these may be, but they're not. Um, they're not uh, only these, murder, torture, deprivation of liberty, forced labor, the worst forms of child labor, and other child exploitation. So they're quite serious things. You know, the threshold for exclusion is quite high. <coughs> serious violations of individuals' rights in situations of war or conflict, we talked about, environmental damage, gross corruption, and other particularly serious violations of norms. So, uh, if we zoom in on conduct-based exclusions, I'd like to give you an overview of what a typical evaluation process looks like. So, identification of the companies that are potentially violating the guidelines. The sources of information here are news monitoring, 
suggestions by organizations or others. So we might get a letter from someone saying, we'd like you to look at this company because of these and these reasons. Or sector studies, where we see that there are sectors where there's a high risk of, for example, environmental violations. We can deep dive into that sector and start identifying companies via that route. Secondly, we then select companies for an initial assessment. And we look at things like, what is the company's responsibility? Are these violations severe? So are they really serious? And are these violations systematic? Or is it a one-off? Does the information seem credible? I can promise you there's a lot of information out there. <laughs> and a lot of information that's not very credible. So this is not always easy. And then the council decides on whether or not to proceed with the analysis. We then do an in-depth assessment of the companies where we are in contact with the company. So we always get the company's information, viewpoints, background on the information that we've found. We often hire consultants to do more work or we get the opinions of experts in a particular sector or on a particular issue. And again, going back to the credibility of information. Can we trust this information? One very important point here is that we don't say the company has done something in the past, so therefore they will be excluded. We also look at the future and say, how likely is it that these violations will continue in the future? Is there an unacceptable risk of future violations? That's a very important point of analysis for us. Finally, we make a recommendation. We always send a draft recommendation to the company for comments. So they can say, they can give a statement, they can even go into details of the recommendation and say, you know, this is not correct here, you have some information so showing otherwise. And that's of course information that's taken into account and reworked into the recommendation. Sometimes, we send a draft recommendation and we get information from the company either that they have changed or that we have credible plans that they plan that they, they will change things in the future in such a substantial way that there's no longer a ground for recommending exclusion. So once we have sent off our recommendation, the Ministry of Finance make their decision if our recommendation is followed, they give an instruction to Norges Bank to sell the shares, to sell the bonds. After that, the decision and the full recommendation, they're both made public. And as it says, this can take quite a long time. Um, sometimes it goes quite quickly. You know, if you have a tobacco company, either they produce tobacco or they don't. It's quite easy to find out. But for some of the more complex conduct-based exclusions, it can take quite a long time. Yeah. To the frustration of quite a few of us. The companies that are excluded, they are reassessed on an annual basis in order to ensure that the exclusion is not based on old information. The companies, they will stay excluded for as long as the reason for exclusion remains. And, you know, if there is no reason to exclude anymore, we will issue a new recommendation saying we recommend to reverse this exclusion for this particular reason. Here are the number of companies that are excluded based on conduct. Uh, as you can see, environmental damage is by far the most common criterion used for exclusion. Uh, but we also have exclusions on human rights and uh, the rights of individuals in situations of war and conflict. The Ministry of Finance may, based on our recommendation, also decide to put a company under observation. 
This means that the company remains in the fund, so the shares and the bonds are not sold. Uh, and we can do this if there is some uncertainty as to whether the conditions for exclusion have been fulfilled or about future developments. Again, we make regular assessments on whether or not there's still a reason to observe, if that has changed to potentially a recommendation for exclusion, or if we should no longer observe the company. And this decision should be made public unless there are some very special circumstances that indicate that this should be known only to the bank and to the council. Observation of companies, this has actually changed now since October 2013. So we now have three companies for observation, uh, one on corruption and two on environmental damage. So if we look at more detail um, at the environmental damage criterion, these are some of the questions that we in the council deliberate on when we look at a, at a specific case on environmental issues. So is the damage serious and enduring? Is it due to a contravention of international laws or norms? Doesn't have to involve legal violations, but that's a question that we look at. What effect will the company's activity have on human health? And has the company done anything to avoid the damage? Uh, and has it done enough to reduce the damage? And then you may not be able to see this at the bottom, uh, but it's an important point. Is it probable that the practice will continue in the future? As I said, we never issue a recommendation based only on the past. We also assist, assess the risk of this continuing into the future. So a couple of examples. Uh, all the way over to your right, there is an illustration for the exclusion of Rio Tinto, which is an international mining group. They are a joint venture part partner with Freeport McMoran in something called the Grosberg Mine in Indonesia. And in the Grosberg Mine, they use a natural river system for tailings disposal. And there is a great risk that acid rock drainage from the company Waste Rock will cause lasting ground and water contamination. So basically, they dispose the waste from the mine directly into the river. And this is something which is virtually impossible to do without seriously damaging the environment. So that is the reason for the exclusion of Rio Tinto. If we move to the middle here, you see a satellite photo. And this illustrates the exclusion of a company called Samling, which is a producer of timber and plywood and veneer. Uh, they're a Malaysian forest resource company. And they have logging concessions, plantations, and land in Malaysia, Guyana, New Zealand, and China. There has been very little information public information about Samling. So in this particular case, we have conducted our own investigations. Uh, we have been both ourselves and with consultants out in the field to look at these forests. And we have also analyzed satellite images. Based on these analyses, we've seen that there are extensive and repeated violations of the license requirements, the regulations and other directives. And these things, this may get into a bit detail uh, on, uh, on forestry and logging, but it's things like logging outside of your concession area. That's basically saying you're allowed to log here, you're not allowed to log here. It may be a national park or other things. So they've been logging outside of the concession area. They've logged in protected areas and they've gone back into areas without doing the proper assessments. We have received very little information from Samling in this case. Uh, what they've said is that they assure us that the logging operations are sustainable 
environmentally sound and in line with regulations. But there's a great gap between this quite general statement from Samling and all the detailed analysis that we've done based on field research and satellite imagery. So based on this, we found that there is an unacceptable risk of the company's illegal and destructive forestry op operations continuing into the future. Now the picture on my left here, we're now moving a bit closer to home uh, for you guys. Uh, this is an illustration of the exclusion of uh, Norilsk Nickel, one of the world's largest producers of nickel and palladium. We reviewed the company's operations at the Polar Division and the Taimir Peninsula. And for many years, the company has emitted large amounts of sulfur dioxide, nickel, and heavy metals. There have been yearly atmospheric emissions of around 2 million tons, and there have been also very high emissions of nickel and copper. And here we've seen significant environmental damage quite far from the operations. And we've also seen that these atmospheric emissions have caused the local, local, local population to have significant health problems. Among other things, it's well documented that respiratory diseases and various forms for cancer are more prevalent here than in other regions of Russia. And what we found here is that the scale of environmental damage is extensive, it's long-term, and it's also partly irreversible, as well as causing serious damage to human health. And we've seen that the companies had plans to significantly reduce emissions. But firstly, they have not really been implemented. And secondly, the most recent findings that we have indicate that the plans are not realistic. So this is a company that's been excluded since 2009 and was just reassessed earlier this year. So let's look at human rights. We had a deep dive into environmental rights. Now let's look at human rights. These are the types of questions that we consider when we look at human rights. Is there a connection between the company's activities and the violations? So it's of course not sufficient that a company is present somewhere where human vi rights violations occur. There needs to be a connection between the two. Has the company actively contributed to these violations? And has the company known about this but failed to stop them? And are the violations currently taking place? So not just something that happened in the past, or is there an unacceptable risk of these violations continuing into the future? So again, the future risk perspective. Now, a couple of examples of companies that have been excluded based on human rights. The picture to the right illustrates the exclusion of Walmart, a company that might be familiar to many of you, a large uh, American global retailer. They have been alleged to run their operations in a way that contradicts internationally recognized human rights and labor rights standards, both through their suppliers in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and in their own operations. More specifically, this concerns employing minors in contravention of international rules, dangerous or hazardous working conditions, that workers are pressured into working overtime without compensation, that the company systematically discriminates against women, and that employees do not have the opportunity to unionize. Now, these facts separately would probably not be sufficient to re recommend the exclusion of the company, but together, they show something which is quite systematic and that has continued over quite some time. Uh, there's another interesting point to be made about Walmart, because when we looked at this company, we looked at their suppliers. And legally speaking, of course, the suppliers are not part of Walmart. 
their suppliers selling, be it t-shirts or dishwashing liquid or whatever else, to Walmart. And normally, suppliers' conduct would not be sufficient for us to recommend the exclusion of a company that buys these products. But because Walmart is so large and such a dominant buyer with these suppliers, we found that their power basically means that they dictate the conditions under which these suppliers operate. So that meant that this was actually, the connection was sufficiently strong to make a case for exclusion. Now to our left, the picture that you see here is a recommendation to exclude the Indian company Zwari Agrochemicals. And this is due to an unacceptable risk that the company through its production of hybrid seed continues, uh, contributes to the worst forms of child labor. So the production of hybrid seeds, so basically production of seeds that are then used to grow cotton, for example. Uh, in 2011 and 2012, we had someone out in the fields, out in these fields, looking at the extent to which child labor was used. And on average, about 20% and as much as 30% of the workforce used in seed production was found to be children. So 20 to 30% were children working in these fields. What we found to be particularly important was the systematic use of children in the production for the company. And we regarded this to be the worst forms of child labor for two important reasons. One was the very young age of the children, and the other one was the health hazards that they were exposed to at work, for example, through the use of pesticides. We also attached importance to the fact that child labor is um, quite well known in this industry. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that there are children working in these fields. And the company had not taken sufficiently explicit steps to do something about and to reduce the extent of child labor. So if we look at gross corruption, these are the types of questions that we consider. Is it probable that the company has carried out activities which may be categorized as gross corruption? Is there an unacceptable risk that the use of corruption will continue? And the company's earlier involvement, their reaction to accusations, and not least their compliance system uh, and ongoing investigations are emphasized. Corruption is quite different from the other two. And the reason for that is the rapid development that we've seen on the legal side. Um, and I'm not uh, familiar with the laws in Russia, but in Norway up until 2003, some forms of corruption were actually tax deductible. <laughs> and now you can get up to 10 years in prison for gross corruption. So corruption has moved from being something which is morally wrong, perhaps, to becoming legally wrong. And that makes it difficult for us to assess because corruption is hidden to a much larger extent. Because it's illegal, companies try to hide it much more than they do when it comes to environmental issues or human rights issues. So that makes it more difficult for us to look at corruption cases. Another reason is that uh, once you get a... Um, uh, once you get a legal verdict on a corruption case, it may be too late, you know, because then things have already happened, the company may have addressed these issues. So corruption is quite a tricky one for us. Not to say that we don't deal with it, because we do, and there are cases that we're currently looking at also on corruption. The rights of individuals in situations of war or conflict. Are the company's activities contrary to international humanitarian law? Which effect do the company activities have on the local population? And again, this future perspective. Is it probable that the activities will continue in the future? So that was it. 
That was a bit of a run through of how we work, uh, what the guidelines look like, and not least uh, a few quite specific examples of exclusions mm -hmm. and recommendations. As I said, the guidelines are available on the website and um, the recommendations are available in full and in quite great detail. Uh, and we are available for any questions that you might have. Okay, we do, this time we have managed to leave, hi Ulva. Hi, <laughs> we have uh, managed to leave a little bit more time for questions. I see we have a, a lot of arms uh, up. I don't know if you saw who was up first. I, d I, I think it may have been the two here. Yeah, okay. The gentleman in grey and then the lady with the blonde hair. ваших решений на те компании, которые не, э, исключены. То есть, э, видели, есть ли закономерность, когда компания начинает исправляться, или же э, это в большей степени просто ну, не поддерживает э, развитие той деятельности, которую они делают. И в связи с этим еще один вопрос. Э, есть ли еще э, такие же мировые практики, которые I think I understood this in Russian. We'll see. <laughs> so if I understand your first question correctly, it is um, to what extent does our work and our recommendations influence the companies to change? Yeah. Uh, and... Um, I think to, it, it depends on the company, uh, but my simple answer would be that it actually influences them quite a lot. And it influence them, influences them on, in at least three ways. Um, so I think one is the signal, the effect, that the fact that such a large actor as the pension fund has an exclusion strategy. So that threat in itself is quite an important one. It's norm setting in itself. Uh, I think the second way uh, is that there are, and this connects to your second question, uh, that there are quite a few other actors that follow the recommendations of the fund. So once we issue a recommendation, it's picked up by quite a few others who follow this recommendation. And I think the third way, um, which may be more an answer to your question, is that we see individual companies making changes based on our recommendations. Uh, more, perhaps more interestingly, we also see them making changes before the recommendation is made. So we see them making changes when we have a dialogue with them. Um, and I can give you a specific example. Um, we have done a sector study on illegal fishing. So illegal, unregulated, unreporting fishing, reported fishing, which is a huge problem. You know, the seas are being emptied for fish, basically. I think something like 70% of global fish stocks are overexploited. So it's a big environmental problem. Uh, and we looked at this and we found some companies that were systematically conducting illegal and unreported and uh, uh, undocumented fishing. Uh, and throughout that process, we have seen at least one of these companies change. Uh, and uh, they have changed their practices, they have changed their ways of working and their guidelines. So that's quite optimistic. Um, we have also recently, and I can't name the company, uh, obviously, but uh, we have also seen uh, another company that throughout the dialogue has implemented a new set of guidelines. And we have decided not to make a recommendation to exclude yet, because we want to see if these guidelines lead to something in practice. Uh, a third example is a company that actually uh, sold their share in a joint venture. 
because of our analysis. Mm. Uh, and we have quite a few companies who come to us and ask, what can we do <laughs> not to be excluded? Uh, we're not consultants, so we can't tell them, but we can tell them why we might want to exclude them. But they will themselves have to figure out what to do to stay in the game, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it was your turn. Uh, Mm. So if I understand your question correctly, it's uh, about bonds and about both corporate and sovereign bonds, the c credits, when we give, give credits to the companies, yeah. Uh, and uh, to your first question about m mass media, uh, yes, mass media is an important source of information for us. Uh, we use it early on, you know, to we cast the net quite broadly and we have automated search engines that help us find relevant information. Um, when it comes to sovereign bonds, so bond bonds issued by countries, uh, we in the Council on Ethics have not made a recommendation to exclude a country. We have only looked at companies. Uh, so I don't really have the basis to answer that question because we haven't made a recommendation like that. Uh, when it comes to selecting which countries the fund invests in, uh, that's a decision that is, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's the bank's decision. Um, it partly, yeah, it's the bank's decision. So they can say that a country is too risky. We will not invest in sovereign bonds of this country because it is too risky. Uh, but we in the Council on Ethics, we haven't made that kind of analysis. No. Nope. Потом здесь, и тоже, если говорите медленно по-русски, то она может поймать напрямую по-русски, Я не совсем поняла вопрос. Не, поняла, по-моему. Ну, просто вообще. Полимене. Mm. I just need to make sure that I understood your first question because you said which other companies like Norilsk Nickel have been excluded or ah let me think uh, I don't think that there are any other Russian companies excluded at this moment um, I'm quite sure that there are no other Russian companies excluded uh, I know we have looked at Russian companies uh, but we haven't excluded any more. It may come. <laughs> I, I can't promise that it will not, or I can't promise that it will. And then your second question, um, what kind of other information sources we use, uh, and you, or information sources, analyses. And uh, you mentioned the example of Greenpeace. 
Uh, we use lots of different information sources, including, as I think you said, international organizations. We use information from the United Nations. We, we use from environmental organizations. Uh, and some of it is credible. A lot of it is credible. Some of it is not. Uh, some of it is outdated and old. Uh, the company may have changed. Um, and of course, also some of it is subjective. You know, we find that sometimes environmental organizations, they have their perspective and the companies have their perspective. So it is our job to try to understand. Uh, I think in, in the old days uh, in the Soviet Union, you used to distinguish between fakti and faktiki. And so fakti is something about where is the future going and faktiki is just sort of not that important. <laughs> so in a sense, our job is a bit like that. Нам вчера представитель Центробанка не ответил на вопрос, будут ли использованы использована ситуация, связанная с санкциями, в которых распространилась Норвегия относительно действий России в Украине в связи с выводом инвестиций. Если я не ошибаюсь, вчера было 13,5 миллиардов долларов вложено в акции которые, российской компании. Вот. И вы, как совет по этике, будете как-то принимать эти, ну, как бы, режим санкций, ситуацию для того, чтобы рекомендовать сохранить или выводить капиталы из российской компании? Mm. Uh, we don't have any direct link between sanctions and our recommendations. Uh, I think that's the simple answer. Uh, and as I said, the only country-specific recommendation that we has, have made is on the sale of military ma materials to Myanmar or to Burma. Uh, so uh, there's nothing that we have said or done uh, on this particular question of sanctions or anything else. Uh, it may be in some cases that sanctions are part of what we look at, uh, but we, this is not something that we've looked at, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, there are, are different ways, I guess, that these can can be used in court. One specific way is that we have uh, we have been threatened on a couple of occasions by companies when we have sent a draft recommendation saying, you know, this is what we found. The council is considering recommending the exclusion of your company. Uh, we've been threatened that they will take us to court. Um, but, you know, sometimes they're quite big companies with a lot of money, quite powerful companies. That has not happened yet. Uh, I have not seen anyone using our material in a court case against a company. No, I have not seen that as far as I know. Mm. Uh, back over there. So uh, I just need to confirm that I understood your first question. Uh, and I think it was if the criteria can change. So we have human rights, etc. And if they can change. Uh, yes, 
Um, tobacco is an example of something that has changed, that came in after the guidelines. So that was a new addition. Um, and um, we haven't seen any other big changes, but I can say the way that we apply the criteria have changed. And they change, for example, when um, John Ruggie, the special representative for the United Nations uh, Business and Human Rights, he came with a set of recommendations in 2011 on business and human rights. And that has shaped uh, how we work on the human rights criteria. But it hasn't changed the regulations formally or the guidelines formally. That may happen in the future. Uh, our view in, in the Council is that we probably need to modernize the human rights criterion somewhat. Uh, so I think we might see that in the future. Then your second question, uh, if the Ministry of Finance, if they have not followed our recommendations, is that right? Uh, that has happened. Um, it happened in the case of PetroChina, which you may know, a large... Chinese company owned by CNPC, which is a state-owned company. Um, our recommendation there was actually regarding Burma, um, not corruption. There's a lot of information on corruption about CNPC and, and China these days. Um, and what we found was that, and this is a bit complicated, but we found that there was basically an overlap between PetroChina, the company in which the fund was invested, and CNPC, the mother company. Enough of an overlap that in practice these two are the same company. Um, formerly there were two different companies, but for example they had the same finance director. You know, and in our mind, if you have one person who is finance director in two companies and a, a lot of other overlap, it is basically the same entity. The ministry disagreed and uh, they said that, uh, you, you know, you can't make that kind of conclusion based on this. So they decided not to follow the recommendation. And then I can't say this is my perspective, but this came quite soon after the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Liu Xiaobo. So some people are saying that there may have been a connection. I won't have a, an opinion on that. And then I'll say I'd, I've been to Chelyabinsk many times. I used to work for Chelyabinsk Piva. So, <laughs> so it's a great place to be. Um, your turn. In English if you want, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are there any terms, specific terms, or um, uh, if it comes portfolio, for example, if the moment is not appropriate, so could it, could it be extended or something like that? Mm -hmm. And another question is, um, uh, how, many, uh, how much you spend uh, for this, for all this research? Isn't, isn't it very much uh, comparing to the management fee at all, overall? Mm -hmm. okay. Good. So how soon are the shares sold? Um, uh, the, uh, if we start with the overall process from when we make a recommendation to the recommendation is public, first it goes to the ministry and the ministry makes a decision. That can go quite quickly or, as I said, it can take quite a long time. Um, we've had one that's been with the ministry for two years. That's extreme, but it's happened. Uh, once the ministry has made a, a decision, they tell the bank to sell the shares. Uh, the bank normally has about three months to sell the shares, so quite a long time, in order to you know, allow for exactly what you're saying, that they're not forced to sell a lot of shares in a short period of time. Uh, so that has, to my knowledge, that has not been a problem because we have quite some time to, to sell the shares. Um, and then how much is spent on research? Uh, I don't have the exact figures in my head, but I think they will be available. Um, uh, I should have brought the annual report for the council with me, but it's on the website, so you can find it. But I can say it's very, very little compared to the cost of managing the fund. 
it's actually very cheap. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> in, <yeah. laughs> yeah. no, I, that's that's a good question. It's probably a better question for the Ministry of Finance because they're the ones who select the people for the for the council. Uh, so I. I don't know very much, but I what I do know is that they need the members to be independent, um, and they need for there to be quite a diversity in experience. So someone who understands the legal perspective, someone who understands the environmental perspective, someone who understands human rights, and also a solid understanding for how companies think and work with these issues. Uh, but apart from that, there is no sort of, you know, I don't think diversity in particular or anything. I, actually, there's one thing. Uh, they strive to have regional representation. This is a very Norwegian thing. So they don't want only people from Oslo, <laughs> but they want someone from the regions. But as far as I know, that's the only formal criteria. Uh, it would also be difficult only to have men or only women. Yeah. Сейчас у нас хватит времени на еще один вопрос. У кого вопрос? Кто очень хочет uh, I think you're right in that it would be limiting only to talk about human rights and environmental rights. So your question, I think, is addressed at two points, maybe, in, in the guidelines. One is the corruption side, which is linked to, to that in, in at least some respects. And then we have the other category, which is other particularly serious violations of ethical norms. And there we are really at liberty to take up anything which may be a serious violation of an ethical norm. Hmm. And I can say, if the council doesn't, uh, the council is not sp supposed to have very specific, very specific expertise on all the issues that we look at, but we can bring in experts. So say on illegal fishing, for example, we've been working with one of the world's best experts and we do similar things in other areas. Ah, management of the fund. <laughs> yeah, no, we only look at the companies that we're invested in. Yeah, not at the management of the fund. So, uh, but ag again, that probably would be a question for the Ministry of Finance and, and the Parliament. Yeah. Okay, I, I would like to slip in uh, one question, mm -hmm. a little bit following up on, on uh, one of the questions we had previously, which is about, that, that question was about uh, whether the, your criteria change which you said they do. Um, and uh, I, uh, I, as far as I've noticed, there has been a debate in the Norwegian media about whether uh, um, the climate impact of companies should be one of the factors that you take in account. So, for example, that you should not invest in coal or even oil companies. Um, and so far, this hasn't been followed up, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but m my question is, to what extent does the public debate in Norway about your work and about your decisions, to what extent are you influenced by it? Are you kind of in a professional bubble where you're just taking your own rational, mm -hmm. uh, technocratic decisions about what's ethical and not ethical? Or are you influenced by the views of others and so on in Norwegian society? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, first just a comment on the climate issue and then I, I'll answer your question. Um, 
when the fund, uh, when the council looks at companies, and we, we, our mandate is to look at cases where there's a clear link between the violation of the ethical norm and the company's activities. You know, so like the Grasberg mine, you know, there's a joint venture mine where you have tailings going into the river. So there's a very direct link between the company and the violation. With climate change, that's quite difficult because you can't link climate change to a single company. So we've had lots of discussions about this in the council. And as you were saying, there have been lots of discussions publicly as well. And where that debate has now landed is that there is a committee which is looking at these issues, uh, looking at coal, looking at oil, looking at gas and climate change and saying, how should the fund deal with this? And they will make their recommendations, I think, before the end of this year. So there will be something new in terms of, of criteria probably on this. To, to your actual question, um, our job is to be true to the mandate. So uh, we always need to ask ourselves, are we really following the mandate and acting in the spirit of the mandate? Having said that, of course, a lot of the information that we get, we get from the public domain. And to the extent that this changes and the discussion changes, of course, our discussions also will change. Uh, and again, an example is the sector studies that we've done on environmental issues, uh, where um, there's been a public debate on fishing, for example, illegal fishing, uh, or on other things. That means that we've zoomed in on that. So it influences in that respect, uh, but more on what we look at as opposed to the decisions or the recommendations that we make. Mm. Uh, before we finish off, I thought I'd just mention one interesting thing, which is that uh, you mentioned in your presentation the exclusion of Walmart, mm. uh, which was a bit debated and so on. And uh, just after that happened, which is a few years, quite a few years ago, uh, uh, we had an event here with the uh, with the American ambassador to Norway, who was here at Nupi, and he was standing exactly where you are standing, <laughs> and he was very angry <laughs> at the Ethics Council, <laughs> raging on uh, about how uh, bad it was and how unfair it was that you had excluded Mo Walmart. Uh, and I don't think anybody from the Ethics Council ever answered him, but at least now you're kind of... Uh, yeah. Following up on the, no, the there same was, there topic. Was, uh, certainly, uh, I wasn't in the council at the time, but I was in KLP, a life insurance company, that actually before the council, we excluded Walmart. <laughs> so we were the first ones out. And it was a huge debate. It was a really big debate. And sometimes we do get those very big debates. Uh, for example, when we exclude Israeli companies, um, you know, we ex excluded uh, a few Israeli companies based on building barriers on the, on the West Bank. Uh, and there's always an outrage from the Israeli embassy. Mm. Uh, so we do, we do get those reactions, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Ulva, for coming and for giving such an interesting presentation. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for break now. We're gonna have one more presentation. Um, which uh, Christian will introduce, and then we'll have a break after that. Okay, as you have seen from the program, we'll continue with um, looking more at the Norwegian petroleum experience. And um, now we'll look at it from the viewpoint of uh, academia, of uh, researchers. So our next speaker is um, Ole Gunnar Austvik, who is our colleague here at uh, NUPI. But he is also professor of petroleum economics at uh, BI, Norwegian Business School. He's educated in political science and uh, economics, as well as uh, having a 
degree in political economy from Harvard. So I think uh, I'll just leave the floor to Ole Gunnar. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a broad uh, issue, and you talked, heard a lot about the fun. I will touch upon the fun as a part of a bigger story. Uh, but my colleague from the business school will take more details about how to handle the fund, I understand. Uh, and the um, Norwegian petroleum experience is a, like a 40, 50 years old story. And I think I should just briefly touch upon the, uh, the history in order to understand why we are doing it in this, the way we do in, in Norway. And then I try to be brief because I understand you're very clever in commenting and asking questions, and that will be, I hopefully, more than half of the session. Um, and then I do not go into details about everything, because we'd rather touch upon what you want to dive deeper into in the discussion. I just wanted, if you want to read something about it later, I have two articles. <laughs> One more, like more empirical from this year, and one two years old that is discussing it, it more theoretically, what Norway has done and why and how it is possible, if possible, to generalize it to other countries. That was the advertisement. Um, the Norwegian story started in the 1960s. Actually, it was an unstart because in 1958, the, no the Norwegian Geological uh, Survey said it is not possible to find any oil and gas at the Norwegian shelf at all in a letter to the foreign ministry. So it was actually excluded. Some companies nevertheless believed that some oil and gas were <laughs> actually there, and they continued to search for it and eventually found it in '69. At the time, the regime in Norway is quite uh, liberal, so the companies had, had not much restrictions and obligations in terms of government intervention. When eventually the oil was found, uh, the government and parliament quite fast went into a much more active role and um, declared some principles in 1971 that has been called the Ten Oil Commandments to make a vision from the Bible that how this shall be treated and how this shall benefit the entire nation. So that was the outset when we had no competence at all about oil and gas. We just knew there actually were a lot of it under the, uh, under the um, sea bottom. Uh, so, these Ten Commandments, it's a translation from the Petroleum Directorate, was actually describing how th this government-business relationship should be, um, be done in quite a concrete manner. First of all, it should be a national management and control of the whole system, and that but you should develop new industrial activities. The Norwegian supply industry, which is now at least offshore, is a world competitive industry, it's non-existing. But it should be developed and the, the resources should be used to develop this new industry. Uh, the state at number seven should be, become involved at all appropriate levels. And you should create a Norwegian petroleum community. That's quite visionary at a time where you had no competence. A state oil company should be established. And all these visions were implemented the year after, when um, Statoil was created and the Petroleum Directorate at the same time. And the director for the Statoil, he was alone, taking the flight to Stavanger with a box, cigar box to sit on, and he should create a new company. And at the same time, he also got about 70% of the Statfjord field, which is a huge oil field in the North Sea. So what should he do in order to create all this? The background for this Ten Commandments is Partly a story from the um, 
um, hydropower history. 100 years ago, we also created a very state interventionary uh, system for how hydropower production and ownership, where the government, in the end, eventually, should own the big hydropower plants. You also had a social democratic system, especially after the Second World War, when you have a special role and strong role of the state in um, important uh, activities in the Norwegian economy. And many say that all Norwegians are social democrats across all parties. And even we have a progress party to the right now, they're very much into this still. Uh, and the disagreement about oil policy has not been whether or not the state should be involved, but rather how. So we have a consensus-oriented decision-making, almost as strong as in defense policy. The oil policy is consensus-driven, mostly. So we created this system. Statoil got all the preferences. They should use the um, opportunities when fields are developed to buy uh, equipment and services from Norwegian industry. I think it's like 40% of it should be Norwegian, even if the Norwegian supply industry was more costly and inferior compared to foreign competitors. Um, they got the best licenses. And because they didn't know how to do it, they needed the international companies to do the job. And for example, with the Statfjord field, um, the mobile, the American company got like 80% of the field, started like 70. <laughs> mobile became operator, and with small letters, it was written in the contract that when Statoil eventually become com um, competent, to become operator. They should take over the operatorship. And Statoil had the right to sit on mobile shoulders and look at what they're doing to learn. And actually in the 1980s, Statoil claimed that they were competent, they wanted to take over the operatorship, and in the 1986 they did. Unbelievable from the American company's point of view, but actually it happened. So in quite a short time, we created a Norwegian supply industry and a Norwegian professional oil company. And, um, and uh, gradually, uh, also an international oil industry. Statoil in 1989, they wanted to go abroad internationally and signed the first contract, I think it was in Azerbaijan, together with BP, to be involved with um, activities outside Norway. So that is the... Uh, infant industry <laughs> uh, support and the startup, and after 15 years approximately, they were able to become uh, industry on its on its own. Over time, when the industry made true, most became more mature. Um, they also started to change in terms of that also was mentioned earlier today. Previously, the oil companies were uh, taking care of all kinds of operations in their activities, down to most details. Subcontractors became more and more important, and the supply industry was taking over much of the work, while the oil company had to contract them and put them together in a sensible way. So it became different, and as Statoil went abroad, to um, also the supply industry went abroad, and we got a totally different industry like in the 1970s. Statoil wanted to be privatized. EU regulations attacked our way of selling gas. I mean, Gazprom is selling all the gas from Russia now abroad. We had also such a system until uh, about the year 2000 with a monopoly sales organization uh, regulated by the ministry and Statoil. This was not good in EU terms. They want liberal market, we had to split it up. And we got new systems to deal with the national interest, to have national control and get most of the money. So in this process, two new state-owned companies were created, that is in 2001. 
Petoro should take care of the state direct financial interest that you probably heard about. And uh, Gasco should take care of the transportation of gas on the Norwegian shelf. So still monopolies, but many more companies participated and you got what you called third party access to the system that we didn't have before. So over time, the system changed. It was done in new ways. And today, we have a state-owned company, owned like 70% of the government, many state companies to deal with the issues that are important, and uh, international competitive um, industry, and st still Statoil, together with Petoro that owns the SDFI, sell about 70% of Norwegian gas, which is quite close to a monopoly position on the Norwegian shelf as well. So, so in this sense, probably not Russia and Norway share some interest in not making the supply side too competitive. <laughs> in terms of internal affairs, um, the, this industry is very much organized from the state level. Okay. I should speak a bit slower. Okay, so when all this is more or less uh, managed on the state level, you have strong ministry like the petroleum and energy visited today, I think, in terms of organizing the business, and they are also superior to the petroleum directorate in Stavanger and also Statoil. The taxes that are put on the companies are all going to the state and not to the local governments. This is a bit different than from hydropower, where the local authorities are getting a small fraction of the taxes. The local authorities in Norway gets the benefit of property taxes and the activity of business in the area but the tax of what we call the economic rent is all going to the state. And in this map, you see the distribution of activities in terms of employment in the petroleum sector. And the biggest um, circle you find in uh, Stavanger, which we call the oil capital. There is about 50% of companies and employment is uh, located in this area. And you can find in general like 20% in Oslo and Bergen each. And then you have the rest around the country. Um, but still it is, even the activities in the Northern Norway are also to a large extent, although not entirely, manage from the company's headquarters in Stavanger and our Oslo. Parts of the country has not any, not much uh, links to these activities. And in some way we say often that we have a uh, split economy, that the one that is benefiting from the oil activities and the high wages, high profitability, in this sector compared to the rest of the economy, which is not linked to that. So you have a pressure from this sector in terms of prices and wages, um, making the rest of the economy less competitive. In terms of external affairs, the Norwegian uh, history also is followed by a lot of um, legal issues in terms of law of the sea. And this law of the sea has been developed since the 1950s and then 70s and later on with bilateral agreements. Last time with Russia in the borderline in the Barents Sea. Uh, some of this law is quite clear in terms of the Norwegian economic zone. All countries have a 200 miles economic zone outside their continental shelves. But in, actually when you count all this sea area, you find that Norway is a very big country. 
It's about seven times bigger than the mainland. And most of the economic activity in Norway is, is actually going on offshore in terms of oil and gas, fish, fish farms, shipping. Like 60% of exports taking place there, which is the most the growing and the high profit, the activities with the high profit. At the same time, we are only 5 million people, which is about 1% of the European Union and 1 promilla of the world. And we shall deal with these issues being the second or third largest exporter of gas in the world after Russia and Qatar. And as a sixth or seventh largest exporter of oil and maybe further down, we were like the third a few years ago. But at least as a combined oil and gas exporter, I think we still are about number three after Russia and Saudi Arabia. And how should we deal with all this, with all this land, all these resources? That means that we also have some foreign policy balancing all the time in parallel. And you know the International Energy Agency was created in 1974 after the first oil shock as a response to an American response to the um, first oil crisis. <coughs> and Norway, as a young oil and gas producer, we did not join this organization fully, but we have an associated membership agreement. We are treated as a member, but we're not part of all the crisis management instruments in the organizations. Actually, Norway tend always to be one foot in and one foot out with most things, like the European Union too. The only international organization we actually joined fully is NATO. The reaction, the other side in the market part of it is OPEC. And you see it's a different part of the world. And we are not member of OPEC. Like Russia is not member of OPEC either. But we meet them. We are meeting in, in, uh, in uh, uh, their gatherings at, in Vienna, and I think Russia is doing that too, in order to balance all this interest of being both a Western country, um, very strongly so after the Second World War, and at the same time having some interest in, in, uh, as an oil and gas uh, exporter, different interest than the other Western countries. So this is a fine balance that has been developed at the same time. We have this part of this balance also with the European Union, where we have a very close relationship. We're part of the single market, but not a member. And we're drawing dialogue when we have to balance it with them as a buyer of the most important uh, products that we actually sell. Then we come to the new. The, 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 the result of all this is that you have an industry which makes much more money than any other industry. The reason for this is a lot uh, caused by economic rent or the extra profit, the super profit from the activities. You have high prices, uh, higher prices for oil and gas than the extraction costs and a normal profit, so you make a super profit. And actually, I don't know if you've seen this from some others, but actually to take benefit of this, the state has introduced a very special taxation system where you, in addition to the normal tax of 27%, they pay 51% as a super profit tax and 78% of the profit of the economic profit is uh, actually going to the government. So the price is going up, the government gains the most, and then now prices are going down, the government is losing the most. And the state direct financial in 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 interest is actually a creation from the 1980s. And when they wanted to change, the conservative government at the time wanted to change the role of Statel, not become too powerful. They didn't propose to privatize it. They proposed to 
give the state the direct ownership rather than that Statoil should have it. And this direct ownership means that the government invests in the field directly and take also all the profit of the share. And this is about 40% of all the activities on the North Sea. So Betoro that is governing this now is bigger in terms of production on oil and gas on Norwegian shelf than Statoil. And as you know, this is uh, the um, revenues from the government, um, where you have about uh, most, the biggest share is coming from taxes, and the other share from the SDFI. And these revenues has come mainly over the past 10 years, creating this enormous fund. And in some way, this money are not, it's not money that we worked for. It's an extra profit after we got paid for the work we've done. So it is a very special situation. And in my view, maybe we're not uh, aware quite how to deal with this situation because this come in addition to the major international role we have as oil and gas exporters. We also now, <laughs> is a very major capital uh, exporter and on the credit side of the balance in the world. So that means that this fund is now the, the biggest in the world as a sovereign wealth fund, a fund owned by a government. And that's a new role of new, new type of players in the international financial sphere. Uh, and you heard a lot, you've learned more about how they do it. But obviously, this is a foreign policy element too. When you actually, s countries around the world has for a time considered Norway as a big energy exporter. Now we're also concerned with the capital. And I understand embassies in Norway, Norwegian embassies around the world, are getting more uh, people coming to ask for this money and how to use them. And it is putting Norway in a different role, where we actually, s this is a map where these sovereign wealth funds are uh, located. And the red ones are sovereign wealth funds created by natural resource uh, profits. The other one is are created by surpluses on uh, trade uh, of other commodities, like, uh, like uh, the blue one, like China. But you see that the surplus countries now are here, and only Norway is up here, mostly, which is also making us a bit different than our Western partners. They are mostly the debitors. So we have some uh, questions then how to deal with it. I think most people would say in Norway and abroad that this model is a success. We manage to maintain political control. The state got most of the money. And in Norway, we trust the state much more than other countries. Will it remain like this? Can we, over long term, on a generational perspective, trust the state? What would you say in Russia? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, Easy come, easy go. We made this money in 10 years plus uh, as an extra profit because of tight oil markets and wars and so on <laughs> to keep the oil price high. Uh, and how will I, our identity be colored by this, all this, this money? It's outside the perspective of how to manage the money. In my view, as I understand it, the fund is managed quite well the professional people doing it quite well. But this is something going behind those concerns. And of course, there are risks with this situation of financial or economic ch change. Uh, so um, even though we are quite happy, I think, mostly in Norway with what has been, been done and how the situation is, it is not obvious that it will last forever with, without unless we are as clever as the people building the industry with all the concerns of the real policy situations. 
and industrial development with the government uh, control. So I shall thank you now, and you have surely some questions, remarks, and maybe protests. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Then we have half an hour for questions. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, for, for one, the uh, input to the fund is from the taxation and ownership in the Norwegian shelf. That has come from the Norwegian industry and the high prices. But your question is maybe how do we manage to uh, invest it and not use it? Perhaps, if that is your question. And I think, again, we are uh, still a consensus-oriented political uh, um, country that we do not have much disagreement. It's on details, in really in the larger picture. Um, whether we should use some more money at home or a bit less, a bit more. But no party is saying actually that we should use so much money that we will destroy the economy in terms of using too much money to get high inflation and a, a higher um, exchange rate. So I think this is back to the 60s, 70s that we still, still have this consensus not to, to, to build the country and the role of the state is quite stable in this political picture. Whether There was some discussion when the Progress Party came to power last year that they wanted to use much more money than the other parties said they would use, but they presented their state budget just now. And it could be presented, I think, maybe Arne on later on will comment on that, but I think uh, that it can be presented by any party, more or less. Uh, so, I th again, I think it's this consensus-oriented situation that whatever party is in power, we have at least till now a strong agreement that we should be careful not to use the money in a way that the, the, the economy is destroyed. I don't know if that's addressed your, your, your question. Okay. Okay, in the middle, mid table. You mean cost of oil in oil production? Cost in oil production. Cost in oil production. 
Yes, okay. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the cost. Well, the Norwegian oil, as is the British oil, more costly than the Middle East oil. You can actually pump a barrel of oil in Saudi Arabia for one or two dollars, I think. Uh, but the, pri the cost in Norway differs a lot across the fields. So the old and big fields are quite, has quite low costs per barrel. When you have smaller fields, the cost runs up on, because you have an economies of scale. That means that smaller fields always have a unit cost higher than the bigger fields. So you can't say that the cost in RC is like this or that. It depends on the field and the size of these fields very often. But you have marginal fields, which is much higher than $14, $15 in RC. I, would, I don't know exactly, but I would say that it can be $60, $70, $80 too. But uh, it, it differs a lot. No. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> because uh, the price of oil is the same whatever wherever it comes from so it's Iranian oil or it's from Norway it doesn't matter for the consumer uh, but it is an interesting thing that the most expensive oil is produced before the least the less expensive oil so if you see the RP ratios around the world like uh, how much oil Iran or Saudi Arabia produces compared to their reserves, they produce much less than we as a high cost producing area. And that is the case for all over the world that the, uh, the, the most expensive oil is produced before the cheap oil. But for the consumer it doesn't matter. But if that, if without the shale oil change and other things changing, uh, the um, the world should actually become more and more dependent on Middle East and Russia. But because other things are changing at the same time, and shale oil is surprised at the same level as our oil, as your oil, as Iranian oil, and as long as that price is higher than the cost, it's profitable to extract it. Hmm. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, forecasting the oil price is a big business, and everyone is doing that. Uh, they're wrong, <laughs> uh, but I think forces in the market tells us that uh, the pressure for lower prices are stronger than the pressure for higher prices, because of the shale oil. Uh, production in the U.S. because of uh, economic downturn in the economy. You have uh, renewables in the European Union. Uh, you also have a Chinese slower growth. So altogether you have actually a surplus of oil growing and uh, according to that prices should actually become lower uh, without guessing the exact price. Uh, and that will affect Norwegian industry as well. You already see that companies are laying off. Uh, but again, the most expensive fields are the smaller ones. Those already developed will produce. Because then you have only operational cost. It affects investments. No? And strangely, companies react not to the expected future price, but to the price of today for investments, which is actually wrong. It should be for the future price they invest. But then psychology is such that they react to the present price when they do their investments. Uh, and uh, what we see in Norway and also other places that the marginal fields, field developments are, are uh, delayed 
or 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 at, at least not the laying off people and 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 wait for what what happens so uh, the activity in terms of investments in the north sea uh, most likely will go down because of the price if the price continues to go down or stay at low price lo low level uh, it is especially a challenge i think in the north where you have definitely even if the prices uh, the cost the fields can be large you have higher costs like in the barren sea for instance uh, and more difficult situation so in all together it's, it's it's more vulnerable compared to the business economics of the development and i would guess this this is one of the, the areas which will be most affected by a price drop in the short and medium term Okay. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, I don't have this this graph here, but uh, our peak oil was in 2003, when we produced some 3.3 million barrels a day. Production today is less than two, uh, but it's stabilized because of new field developments. And the expectation just now is that it will remain on this level, but gas production will increase a bit more and then stabilize. In total, I think Norwegian Shelf has not peaked yet, but is about to peak when you add oil and gas together, which is quite different uh, from the Russian situation where you have um, regained what was lost after the Soviet Union <laughs> was dissolved, and you're now back to the levels of uh, that time. So whether or not that is a new peak or not, I don't know, because it is a like a, uh, you know, like a bump. Uh, I think in general, Norwegian oil and gas will never run out. <laughs> it will just be less, depending on the price, depending on technological change. Uh, you have two theories of this. One is that we run out of oil and gas. The other one is that we will always invite, invent new technology and find more. So actually the price will go down to the marginal cost of new developments. But I think either theory indicates that you will actually produce oil and gas for as long as you can use it, but in a different mixture with other energy sources than today. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, that means that the world probably will survive without a catastrophic peak oil scenario. And again, then, the tense that the Opinions change with this current situation. If you have high prices, you believe in peak oil. If you're low prices, you don't believe it anymore. <laughs> and I think it's more a mixture of the two, that uh, that uh, the world will never run out of oil. The, the, the oil, shale oil and gas discoveries and technological change in the United States is actually a sign, is what at least one explana uh, possible uh, explanation for this uh, uh, scenario that we will be a fossil society for a long time. But the price level then is another thing. What do you think about Russia? Please, one, one. <laughs> one person at a time, Fashalsna. Huh? My fault. <laughs> Microphone. Да, 
Башкирии уж там вообще уже. Mm -hmm. В Башкирии, это далее, понятно, что там уже это. У нас есть на севере, на, кра... на крайнем севере много месторождений, которые э, сейчас запасы есть, но туда не проведена труба. А, э, то есть, как бы, чтобы провести трубу. Нет, извести извести то можно, но чтобы ну, извлечь, нужно сделать трубу, а для этого нужно много бумаги выкрасить. То есть это нужно много инвестиций в это вложить. А будет ли как бы государство вкладывать в это? Это как бы вопрос, во-первых. И стратегия, как насколько она будет пользоваться, от этого много зависит. Окей. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? So, if your question is uh, that whether Norway will expand market shares in the Central and East European countries as part of the conflict with the, uh, in Ukraine, yeah. So, I think, but I think Norway, in, in general, I'm not an official representative, so I'm just commenting. No, uh, I think Norway in general has a attitude that we should favor that the market becomes more flexible and, and more interconnectors so the market actually works in this area too that would be good for norwegian export and for the security of supply as such uh, i don't think norway can expand their oil production much at all and the gas production is limited so we will never be able to replace uh, russian gas in this way but it will be more flexible for uh, for uh, for everyone actually we also have some interest together with the russian gas export in terms of market terms and prices we are actually in the same boat as, as another part of it no uh, so i don't see norway as a major player in 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 the market we we will not probably as such uh, build infrastructure in Russia or in, in Poland or wherever. I think Donald Tusk has proposed that the EU Commission should uh, pay for like 75% like of the uh, this infrastructure, and that is a totally different actor uh, with a different, di different logic. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if EU will do that, but that has to make sense. Not, not that Norway will be involved with it, I think. But if we get market access, I would guess we will sell. But it will never be the volumes that can replace the any close to the Russian size. No, so I think you are tied to each other for a long time. Any more questions or? Then I'll have add one question for my on my own. I think uh, yesterday there was a question in the audience uh, about uh, regional differences in the distribution of uh, petroleum revenue, which is uh, well, very visible in in Russia. And I know that Uligunaire 
knows has a better answer to that than I think we had yesterday. I think, yeah, of course, it's, um, as I mentioned, this is a, Norway is a state centralized decision making system, so you have a strong state. Um, but uh, uh, we have, uh, and th that means also the taxation of these activities goes to the state. And as I said, the distribution of benefits in activities as such, in terms of local taxation, is almost nothing. It's only the property tax. But in those areas that you have uh, activities, you will also have the benefit of the industrial activities. The rest of the country benefit from a strong state. That's why I think partly we trust the state in Norway and in Scandinavia maybe more than other countries. So it's redistributed uh, in various ways to the local communities. And obviously Norway also have a different, like the third dimension in politics, uh, not just left-right, but also a spatial dimension where uh, uh, it's a great uh, number of people believes in the maintenance of people living in districts. Uh, compared to Sweden, it's quite different, only as a neighboring country. So the strong state means also the redistribution of money and benefits that you can actually live different places. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is uh, a great consensus too. We always also discuss the degree of the spatial dim dimension. It costs something in one sense, maybe it's not so costly in the longer term, but uh, Compared to other countries, I would say that we are quite close to some sort of a consensus on this, but not entirely. Um, so the ma main thing that this money will come back to the rest of the country, not involved with oil activities, uh, through the general activity of the of the state, and how it distributes redistributes money to local to counties and local municipalities. We'll have one last question down there. I think from, uh, well, it's a very, very interesting question. And this is getting attention around the world, I think, compared to any other country in the world. The Norwegian system is more open. Compared to UK, Canada, other countries with oil and gas activities, we are much more open. That's been part of the system from the start, that the openness is a part of controlling the system, that you make uh, everything available, makes it more difficult to, to, f to cheat on the system. So it is a part of the control, not only from a democratic point of view, but also from the industry with so much money and power to make it uh, yeah, transparent for anyone. I think gas prices has not always been transparent though, but in terms of licenses, the agreements uh, in general, not in detail, uh, who owns the fields, who are the shareholders, everything like this, is like the uh, ethic fund, transparent for every 
everyone and you can log into the ministry's homepage and you get an updated report every year. How that is possible? It's again I would I would say it is because of this this consensus oriented system that we more than many other countries trust each other and that is uh, how we can avoid to get a split in the society that we are transparent on this issue. So it's back to this building up of the industry. Maybe it will not last forever, I don't know, but it has been quite a strong belief and it has been, I, heard, I never heard any discussion and any claim from anyone ever that you should not have this openness in the system, not even not from the companies. It's interesting that Norway has quite strong regulations, high tax level, openness, things that you should believe that companies didn't like, but uh, the benefit for the companies, it's, it's foreseeable. You can invest, you know what you get, and if you have a risky, more political risky country, you need more profit, you need shorter time horizon, so actually you get something from a company point of view too, uh, for the costs that you incur on this. That's my best approach, I think. Okay, then, yeah. thank you very much, really good night.
Ben denizciyim ama. Sen nasıl kandı öyle geldin de? Valla. Okay. Окей. Okay. Um, end of the break. Конец перерива. Um, I am, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who's the last speaker of today. Uh, he's a very busy man, so we had to make the day quite long to make some space for him to come here after other things. Uh, his name is Arne Joni Saxon, and he is a professor at the Norwegian Business School, the BI. Um, 
um, which is uh, on the other side of Oslo. Um, he has, I, I, I asked him how to introduce him, like is, if there's one or two other jobs I should highlight. And he said, well, he's worked all over the place <laughs> for the Ministry of Finance, for the Central Bank. Uh, he's been chief economist for uh, uh, stock brokerage and so on. So he's had a, a lot of different uh, uh, jobs. He's been to Russia. Um, and in the 1980s, he worked for two years here at Nupi, which is, of course, the most important thing. Uh, anyway, he's going to uh, say more about the oil fund. Remember, 100, no, 860, 70 billion uh, dollars uh, we're talking about. So that's why we're talking a lot about it. Um, a very central part about, of how uh, the Norwegian oil sector and oil income is, is managed. Uh, um, but I think maybe Arne Jon's uh, take on this may be a little bit different. He writes a uh, frequent newsletter, uh, which uh, I'm among the recipients of it, where he covers a lot of very interesting, uh, very different topics. He's written on Russia, among other things, uh, but also about this topic. And that's why we invited him, because he wrote some very interesting points uh, about the the relationship between society and the oil fund and the public debate and so on. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the nice words. Actually, I worked in Nupi in the late 1970s, so it was not in the in the, in the 80s. <laughs> and uh, then I came from Stanford. I got my PhD in economics in 1975 from Stanford University. And that's why I have this um, vignette of Jacob Wiener that uh, some economists get too much of a rigorous training, so they forget the broader uh, views of things. And uh, that's why I think this conference is very good, because we have economists, we have political scientists, and we try to, uh, to convey uh, uh, certain viewpoints, but it's for you to decide and for you to think about it. Let me start by making one observation that uh, the very elegant lady who was from the Ethical Council uh, talked about. Uh, it was a question, uh, what happened to the credit, if you remember, uh, when the oil fund decides that it should no longer uh, be into that company. And just being an economist, I like just to make the point that there is no money withdrawn. You have a bond, and if you have a bond, that means that you have a claim on the company, and a bond is a claim, so it says you pay five rubles, five rubles, and 105 rubles. It's a promise for a future cash flow. And I owe that bond, and if I don't like to own it anymore, I sell it to some other person. So the company as such doesn't feel anything. The company isn't losing credit. The company just uh, notes that somebody else has taken over the claim on that very company. And since I want to sell my claims, the price uh, might uh, go down, and that means that the rate of interest goes up. So when the company needs fun along the next quarter, it has to pay. Do you speak a little faster, you mean? Yes, I will. Yes, I will try. Yes. So when you sell the bond, <laughs> the price goes down and the rate of interest goes up. So if the company wants to fund itself later, it has to issue new bonds, but then it gets less money for the same promise. So it makes future finance more expensive. Nothing happens with the present finance. So I wanted to stress that technicality. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, these issues here. And, uh, and um, uh, uh, it has been stated over and again that the fund has been successful. Uh, but there are certain elements that we should also keep in mind that has been um, instrumental. Namely, and that I think is my main message, that the running of the fund is a continuous research experiment. It's not settled once and for all. What you have been through these two days is sort of the blueprint. This is the way it's set up, this is the way it's done, and everything looks perfect. And I'm going to uh, make some observations uh, that makes it a bit more complicated. Uh, 
let me start out with one observation. In the late 1970s, it was a huge discussion in Norway, namely that we ought to be exporters of capital and that the private banks should do it. Uh, and this idea keeps coming up again all the time. Uh, recently, there is a professor at my school who has this idea that we should export uh, the raw material, namely that what he calls capital. Uh, now I go to page 12. I have to go all the way through, I'm sorry. Page 12, yes. So there is lobbying. Uh, as a first observation I like to make is that lobbying and corruption seems to me to be two uh, sides of the same coin. When you lobby, you put money and effort into speaking to people to make them make decisions that is favorable to you. It is legal, there are rules, and you can lobby according to the rules. If you do corruption, it's more one way. Uh, in the secrecy, I pay you a little cash and you decide for my benefit. But uh, I have to speak uh, less rapid. Uh, but uh, it is basically the same thing, namely that money enters into the decision making where money has no place to go or to do. So lobbying is a big problem in America. And I, as I understand it, corruption is some kind of a problem in Russia. Uh, so um, now there is uh, this idea propping up again that Norway ought to develop the raw material of money. It's just stupid to my mind. It's totally stupid. Should we have intelligent people trading assets and make money for the benefit of the country? We have a fund with 400 people, and they take charge of enormous amount of money. I will get back to that later. So it's very efficient. It is very efficient, very well done. It could have been better, but it's well done. But my point is that having intelligent, well-paid Norwegian spending time on just changing money is a total waste. We need engineers. We don't need financial engineers. The financial sector has been just way too big. And who is saying that? Mr. Alan Greenspan. And I take it you have heard about Mr. Alan Greenspan. He was head of the... Is it okay now? Okay? Yes. I like to be friends with the ladies. Um, so, Mr. Alan Greenspan, he said in an interview in 1950s uh, the GDP that was being made in the finance sector was 3%. Now it is 8%. So very many very smart people, they do trading, but they don't create much value. And this is a very big loss to society because finance pay very nicely. So the most smart people goes into finance. So my point is that for the Norwegian society, we are very well served with only 400 people taking care of $850 billion. More people doing it would not be good for Norway. It would be good for the financial community. And, and, and that brings me to the second point, namely that the civil servants in Norway have been very clever. They are very honest, and they are very smart, and they are hardworking. And when I speak to this audience, I might insult you a little, but I take the chance. We can tell you about how we do things, but we cannot change you. It is a cultural issue. How do you manage to have the norms so that people behave decently? We need rules, we need uh, sanctions, we need accountability, we need transparency, we need all these things. But at the end of the day, you need a sort of an atmosphere or an ethos that is conducive to a decent behavior. And that is beyond economics, it's beyond political science, but it's 
important for the success of such an endeavor. Um, so let me now go back to, I hate these PowerPoints, but uh, that's always the case. Page five, yes. Um, uh, the, the, uh, you have heard already that the government appropriates the bulk of the oil rent. 78% Ole Gunnar said, I don't know my field, so I put it at 80. Uh, and and uh, uh, here is, here is uh, the underlying elements that I alluded to that are in place, and that is a bit hard to export. Let me make one economic observation uh, similar to the first I made, namely that the fund is a net asset. There are no liabilities. I have given talks about funds in other uh, communities like this one, and if you borrow money, put it into a fund, then you have no wealth because you borrow equally much as you put into the fund. Here we have a fund and all the money from the oil sector that goes to the state goes into the fund. And the fund writes one check once a year. It writes one check once a year, namely to pay for the deficit in the public sector so that the public sector exactly balances. So if I am uh, running, this is a big family, I'm running this family, I'm the head of the family. And you do all kinds of things. And we have, uh, I have a solid amount of money in the bank, which is our common, our common uh, ownership. And then every year we sit down and you have made surplus, you have lost some money, and altogether there is a certain uh, loss that has to be covered. So I pay out of my fund, is to cover the loss so that the, it's all balanced. And in addition, money comes into that fund from somewhere. That is the oil money coming into the fund. I write one check and then it's even out. So what is on the oil fund is a net asset. It's a net asset. Uh, and that trick uh, uh, has not uh, been understood by all nations. They put oil money into the oil fund but then they run a deficit on the state, so they borrow some other place. And then the oil fund is not a net asset because you are accumulating debt other places. Um, so so uh, uh, that is important to, to remember. Alluding to Alan Greenspan once more, I would like to do on the 25th of January 2005, uh, 2001, Mr. Greenspan said that he went along with Mr. Bush, who became president, to take down taxes. And that was politically motivated because Bush didn't like taxes, Greenspan didn't like taxes. So they cut taxes for the rich people in America, to put it simply. And his argument was that if we don't do that, the state will have a net asset position 10 years down the road. Because Mr. Clinton was very clever economically, he had big surpluses. So the debt was being paid down. And when there is no more debt, and the government is still running a surplus, it has to buy private bonds or private uh, assets, private stocks. And then Mr. Greenspan said that if you do that, then you mix private and public business. So the government should not buy bonds in America, but the Norwegian government buy bonds not in Norway, but abroad. So the state fund is not invested in Norway. So I cannot go to the state and say, I want to sell my stocks, I want to sell my shares, so that you can fund my activity. Because those money are only used to buy something out there in the big world. And then you avoid what we call rent seeking. Namely, there is no use for me to try to invite uh, English Lingsta for dinner 
he is the head of the fund, and if I invite him for dinner, I think he will have to say no in the first place. If he comes along and I give him a diamond ring for his wife or his mistress, uh, then he will not take it. If he takes it, he still cannot lend me money. So it's no domestic use of the money uh, that the fund can employ. So uh, uh, when you don't lend out the money domestically, then the banks have been arguing, let us do the management of the money, and the clever bureaucrats, no, we will have a monopoly doing it in the in the central bank. So, so uh, here we have. So, so the point here is that Greenspan should have said to Mr. Bush, "Yeah, I don't think you should take down taxes. Let us accumulate claims on the rest of the world, like the Norwegian fund is doing." And then there will be no tax cuts in America, and then the situation financially for America would have been much better. Um, there is one thing I will get back to, namely that real estate is a new asset class. We used to have 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds and then we want to accumulate real estate. And that means that the fund is buying into Regent Street in London, into Paris, into what have you. Um, now, there, I, I have written a little paper on the fund, and then I did not, I wasn't able, to get a good answer to one question, namely, this picture here, here is the return on the portfolio, and here is what you are measured against, or the benchmark. And when you do better than the benchmark, you are a clever man running the fund, okay? And then all of a sudden, the two curves collapse into one, so that you lose all the extras, you lose 70 billion through active management. Um, that we lost the 633 minus 70 is okay, but the 70 was through active management. And my reading is that the fund did not understand what they were doing because they were taking risk without that being measured. I will not go into the details, but the point is that if two, if two bonds covariate very similarly, you don't measure the risk which is there. So uh, they woke up realizing that they hadn't been so clever. And my uneasiness is that this has not been uh, taken out in the open. Uh, so I think that this is uh, something that they should have admitted more openly and more honestly. But I also think that central bankers and politicians, they can never admit doing anything stupid. That's why I'm a professor, because the name of the game here is to tell people that they are wrong, and to have people tell me that I am wrong. That is the nature of scientific inquiry. So uh, this, I think, is not a nice chapter, not that they lost 70, but that they were not able to admit it more openly in retrospect. I might be wrong, I might not have searched enough, uh, but I have spent some time on it, and then I and then I came across uh, this citation by Professor Andrew Ang, who has worked extensively with the fund, and he says ex ante. He says ex ante, namely that this could have been avoided if you had been more clever. Uh, so this is a mu this is. Uh, this is a, 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 a little unhappy experience, 
according to my reading of it. However, the fun was successful afterwards, but that doesn't mean that she behaved in incorrectly. If you look at the fun, there are two pillars in my view, namely that we only use every year about 4% of the value of the fun at the start of the year. I guess you have heard that before yesterday, so this has been discussed. And, um, and then Norges Bank Investment Management is the sole um, uh, manager of the fund. And, um, and uh, now there is a, now there is a, uh, uh, but all of the time there is a political discussion. And I was very impressed by the lady who talked about ethical considerations. But from a bigger vantage point, I think uh, the Ethical uh, Council is, a, is a, um, a decision to please the left in Norway. The leftist people in Norway, they like Ethical Council. The rightist, they are more concerned about return. So there is this discussion, uh, and you can find it in the State Department or Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They like to do politics out of the fund. And the people in the Ministry of Finance, they hate to do politics out of the fund. So uh, you have to give a little here, and you give a little there. But at the end of the day, it is the Ministry of Finance that carries the day. And these days, whether the ethical council will continue is a bit up in the air. But if you read through the white papers, you always get across a sentence, something like, like uh, that, namely that the investment strategy is based on achieving the highest international purchasing power from the capital in the fund, taking risk into account. So when the Ministry of Finance presented it, it says that tobacco is an industry on the decline. So the return on stocks in tobacco will be less. So it's useful to take it out. Mr. Al Gore, uh, Vice President in Clinton, who is very concerned about the environment, argues along the same lines on, on coal extraction, because coal is polluting, so coal is a dying industry. That's a very different argument from the argument that tobacco is not good for you, or the argument that, uh, that uh, uh, rotten air neither is good for you. But it's always that line of argument that the Minister of Finance pursues, namely, am I interpreting again? No. Uh, uh, <laughs> so th that is always the line of argument that the Ministry of Finance pursues, namely, that we do it in order to maximize returns. But they know, and we know, that when you reduce the universe of stocks you can buy, you are always worse off. If you have uh, 1,000 players in soccer and you are to select 11 to be the national team, you will not get such a good team if you take it down to 800. So, so, so by nature, to exclude companies is not to the liking of the Ministry of Finance because the expected return has to come down. But that is a small price to pay. And in addition, uh, there are people who would argue, like, uh, like Ilva, that it is uh, more important to do good assessments of companies and perhaps make them change their ways. I'm not taking a position on it, I'm just taking you a bit beyond the, 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 the formal presentation that you have met, namely that there are internal 
viewpoints that are differing and that there is some sort of a give and take behind behind uh, what you what what you hear and also uh, uh, she oh, you talked about uh, the ambassador didn't like Walmart he didn't like Boeing being taken out either it's a very delicate issue it's a very delicate issue and one of you asked are there any court that you can go to and that is not the case so if I'm running the oil phone and I don't like the shares in your company because you are not following what I'm saying, so I don't like your shares. So then I sell your shares. Am I doing any Ill thing illegal? I just sell something? I mean, I'm at large to sell whatever I like or buy whatever I like. But you will feel the heat because you will have more expensive to fund yourself around the corner. So you will come back to me and say, don't do it. And you cannot appeal to any court. So it's a very delicate, a very delicate issue. Um, um, I have in my capacity as a professor, uh, something called Norges Bankwatch. And that is an annual um, survey of how Norges Bank does monetary policy. Every year it is a report by some experts, 20, 30, 40 pages, and the head of the central bank or the deputy, he answers to the report, there's a discussion and it's openness. So I'm suggesting that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, the oil fund could have something similar, an independent, not too formal, but an independent annual uh, expert group that would go over what has happened. Now, uh, we have talked about what should we do with the oil money. But equally important is what does the oil money do to us? And uh, uh, we all have good ideas what we should use oil money for. All these things are very, we need all of these things all the time. And, but what does the oil money do with us? And here are some not so nice effects, namely that labor market participation is a bit down and that uh, expectations are on the rise. In Norway, you hear quite often, this is not acceptable in the richest country in the world. And I hate that expression. Then you push the bill to the government. You have to give us better roads. You have to do all kinds of things. So, so that's why I'm saying that a very successfully run fund is an oil fund, which we don't think about. We go about our daily work and we don't pay attention to the oil fund. Because once we start to do that, we expect more. And if you expect more, you become unhappy. Because happiness is a difference between expectations and reality. So if expectations run ahead of you, then you become less happy. And, and this is very much the case with the oil fund. So uh, I have, I have, a, I have a sambol, what is it in English? Huh? But the sambo thing is cohabitant. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have a cohabitant for 20 years, and she is running two kindergartens in Oslo. She's very clever. She runs me too, perhaps, but she runs at least two kindergartens in Oslo. And they have very modest amount of money. She goes on a seminar with her employees, and they have to pay uh, for the travel. They can buy the food, but they have to pay for overnight. And here I am working at a business school, and we have much more money, a private business school. We don't have much money, but we have much more than she is having. And every year, you should cut 2%. 
off the budget. That's gone on for 10 years. So I'm here we have all this oil money, and kids are the future, and they keep cutting. And in a sense, I think it's stupid. On the other hand, it attests to the fact that we don't behave as if we have all the money in the world. The government sector is very uh, uh, careful not to overspend. And, 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 and I sometimes I think they overdo it. And kindergartens, I think, is one case in point. Other people would point to other things. But this mentality is very important. If we started to behave as millionaires, then we would not only have the fun rundown, but we would waste our talents and our working days. And in that respect, the fun is not that big. If we reduce effectiveness by two or three percent, the fun is gone. So we tend to think that the fun is huge, and it is huge, but compared to the damage it can do to us as thinking, working individuals, uh, it doesn't take that much for the fun to lose its net beneficial effect for the country. And, uh, and uh, this, I think, is what has uh, happened in Norway. Let me end because uh, this is a bit hulte uh, uh, this is a bit uh, unorganized. But let me sum it up. Uh, the size of the fund, it's, uh, it is 5.6 billion Norwegian. China is 4,000 billion dollars. That is five times as big as Norway's. Whereas there are 260 Chinese per Norwegian, so our fund is 50 times bigger per Norwegian as the Chinese fund is per Chinese. So it's huge and still it is quite modest if we allow it to erode our working morale, our ingenuity and our efforts. Uh, and uh, the central elements uh, that we have discussed earlier is transparency and accountability. And transparency means that it is an open book. We can see all the explanations, we can see all the discussions, but we have something more to learn by having independent experts, I think. And secondly, we have accountability. When the fund lost money, then the head of the fund went on permanent pay. He does not have any incentive pay. And his pay is a bit less than $1 million. And of course, I would love to collect $1 million in uh, annual pay. But sitting on this much money and being paid less than $1 million is a bad joke in American eyes. So uh, the fun has a norm, which is that we should also behave within reason. So I think I end there, and then we have some time for questions and discussion. Are we still friends? <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, now I'm, I'm keeping some order, one, two, three. Uh, I took away uh, one key lesson mm -hmm. from this uh, presentation, which is that you consistently refer to the pension or petroleum fund as fun. Uh, and yes, it's fun. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, our first question here. Please, that's okay. That's okay. Thank you very much for your support. Thank
Yes. Okay. Um, the participation rate is on the decline. So that means that less people work now than used to work because we have good social security instruments. So the incentive to leave the labor market uh, is higher in Norway because we feel and the state does provide for a minimum living standard. That is one element. but. If you look at the engineering, we have a big advantage in the sense that engineers in Norway are paid quite modestly compared to what they are paid in other countries. They're very high, clever people. And why is that? The reason is that people like to stay in Norway. And if you like to stay in Norway, the wage you could have gotten in New York is not relevant for the pay that you get in Norway. So there is little mobility for many reasons. And also there is a norm, which I have on one of these slides, namely that when you have wage negotiations between the monopoly labor union and the monopoly uh, employee association, they look into the totality, so they keep wages a little lower than would be the market and a bit more even. So in Norway, the wage of the very clever is a bit too low in the market sense, and of the less clever, a little bit too high. But the totality for the company is about right, to put it very simplistically. Yes. Uh, I could uh, take the liberty of adding a point, um, because I think as, as Arne Jun uh, mentioned, for example, people who work in kindergartens, uh, they work very hard, they have a lot of responsibility, they have uh, quite low pay uh, by Norwegian standards, and they have, uh, the kindergartens are, are very poor, they really have almost no funds to do anything compared to many other institutions. And the same is true of the schools, uh, it's, it's a very similar situation. And there are probably other areas, but, and I'm not sure if Arne Jan will agree with this, there are other sectors of the Norwegian uh, state apparatus which are extremely wasteful and where people don't work at all. Uh, personally, I worked in the, in the, the ministry of, um, I guess we, in English logic you call it the ministry of, uh, of municipalities and the interior and, and uh, so on. And uh, I don't think anybody around me worked at more than 20% of their capacity. Uh, whereas there are other jobs uh, where you might work at 150% of your capacity, or sort of eight, nine work hour a day, and then more hours in the night. But in, in the ministry, nobody was really working, really. You know, one hour per day, and then that's it. Um, so I think, and I think maybe that that uh, kind of uh, laziness and kind of a waste of time, uh, personally, I experience it as, as kind of the Norwegian taste of the resource curse, and that we have a little bit of that, 
uh, it reflected in this area, but it's not very noticeable because we save a lot of money because of lower corruption and for other reasons we save money. So, so we get to, in balance, we come out reasonably okay. A another interesting aspect of uh, kind of talent and the labor market is that many young Norwegians, uh, for example, a friend of mine who worked for Danske Bank, a major Danish bank which has offices in Norway, um, recently, uh, he was he worked there for eight years and he was fed up, so he quit his job, and then he will go and look for another job, and this is quite standard for a reasonably well-educated Norwegian. Is you you first quit your job, and then you start thinking about well, what else could I do? Uh, whereas I think in if you go to any other country in Europe, people will first try to get another job. And then when they get it, they'll tell their boss, look, you know, it was nice, but I, I'm moving on. Thanks. Okay, next question is here. Um, here is uh, my opinion on it, namely that a new committee was just established to look at that issue. And uh, it is uh, run by a previous student of mine, so I think it would be a nice report. Uh, and uh, the issue is two things. Is 4% too much? And secondly, can we utilize 4%? Because now we only spend 3%, a little less than 3 So the rule is not being stuck to. And uh, But the important thing, the important thing to my mind, is that this is a... F ah! How fancy. This is, uh, this is uh, a research project. It's learning by doing. So there is no such thing as a fun. We have finally found the solution. This is the way it is, and this is the way it shall be for the next 100 years. No, it is a continuous debate. It's a continuous discussion. It is a continuous fight. And now a paper or a report is to be written about exactly that issue. But we are fortunate in the sense that we use less than the rule, so it's not, it's a bit absurd because the Minister of Finance cannot find useful ways to use the money, as Ole Gunnar said, then you will have inflation if you spend too much. So we have an existing structure in the economy we like to take care of. We are not standing on sand and having nothing and taking up oil. We are in a country with a diversified business environment that we don't want to uh, leave by the wayside. Thank you. Um, and now the next question is from Paula, who is one of the speakers for tomorrow. She just arrived. Uh, yeah. So I, I was late, so I hope not to, uh, to, to, to say something particularly inappropriate. But uh, your talk was very fascinating. So. Uh, should your, would your, uh, let's say, more general or overarching argument or point be that uh, the money from the fund should be spent more throughoutly? I mean, you should, the, the, the fund money should be spent more than it is now. Or should it be, would it be your point that is not, uh, I mean, uh, spent in the right way? So it's, it's a matter of policies? My, my point is that, as I said, we should behave as if we didn't have the money. We should think of it that every year we get the free lunch, 3 or 4 percent of the fund, and we have to behave decently and productively. And uh, every Norwegian has a point he likes more money to be spent on. I have my point, which is, of course, the best. Other people have other opinions. And it that is okay, but we have to stick to the rules, spend 3% or 4%. And when people say, we have oil money, we should use it for this and that. 
then he is not an economist. Or if he is an economist, he is a very unsophisticated economist. Because if it is profitable, you should do it anyhow. So we have made a decision that the fund should be for eternity. If we spend the return, the fund is always going. And future generations will benefit from it. So it is just a, it is as if you have a, a rich grandfather. And this rich grandfather, you know every year on Christmas Eve, he comes and he puts a check on the table. And he says, have a nice Christmas. And you know the check, the size of it, and you have to live within the means. There is, even if you have all the wealth in the world, he will only give you the check with 100 rubles or whatever. So it's an extra, but you have to do your work and be active uh, and behave accordingly. So that is why I hate the discussion, what shall we do with the oil money? Forget it. What does the oil money do with us is equally important. It's finally your turn. Um, I'm looking for some figures, but forget it. Uh, every day, every day, about two hundred million dollars are put into the fund because that is the tax from the oil companies and other types of income. So two hundred million dollars every day is put on the table, and I have to invest it. I have to buy stocks. I have to buy bonds. I have to buy real estate. 200 million dollars. And if you look at that chunk of money, it is more than the 4%. So every year more money comes into the fund than what is taken out. So the funds keeps growing. And the day there is no more oil, even if Ole Gunnar said that day is never coming, assume that there is no more oil. So oil is out and the fund is whatever it is. Then if the assumptions are valid, we will only use the return. So the fund will stay put at $10,000 billion or whatever, and we will use 4000 every year, or 400 every year. So then the fund is for eternity if the return is equally large as the takeout on average over the years, the fund will always be there. Not sure if I understood correctly, but could there be a situation in the future, some kind of crisis? Yes, of course. In which the government could say, 4% was a good rule, but we need to spend 10% this year because something happened. That's what you mean, no? <laughs> let, let, let me try once more. <laughs> let, 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 me, let me try once more. Uh, you just have a chalk and something. Well, we don't have it. Uh, there is something called the fund, and they, they own stocks and bonds. Uh, 
So here we have uh, here we have stocks and here we have bonds, lots of papers, and they give you cash flow. So that is the fund. And then the oil business every year, you don't know how much taxes are coming in. So you just receive from the oil companies. If the oil price is high, you get more money from the oil companies. So that adds to it. But then we pay out not exactly 4% because what we pay out is a political decision based upon the economy. If there is full employment and activities are high, we pay out less. But we don't pay out, we just pick up the bill so that the government budget is in balance. If you are my daughter and I shall balance your budget, you make 100,000 rubles a year. And next year you spend 104,000 rubles. Then I give you 4,000 rubles, so you exactly balance. Okay? So this is the way it is. I give you whatever it takes to balance. And then uh, what I give you is less than what is coming in. So next year the Fed is 110 million rubles or whatever. So you cannot predetermine how big the fund is in the future because it depends upon what accrues to the fund based on profit and oil prices. You're not happy still? <laughs> Little less unhappy? A question for me. What, what if she spends much more? Yes, then I have to pay 10%. Then I have to pay you 20 rubles or 40 rubles. But you're only allowed to give 4% of no, your... No, 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 no. That's a norm. And the rule is that whatever the deficit, I have to pay. But the point is that the politicians have been clever not to have more than 4%. Mm -hmm. But if that should happen, if the world comes to big problem, we can use 10, we can use 15%. So there is no written in stone what we should do, but this is a wise decision and people have accepted it politically. And that gives a very solid base for discussions in the parliament. But don't you think that the 4% rule, that you're only allowed to use 4%... Well, well, allowed to, but this is the guideline. Yeah, that you, you aim to only use, uh, it's kind of a rule of thumb, yes. to only use 4% of the interest rate accrued by the fund. Uh, it seems to me that over time, as governments from different parties uh, representing different parts of the electorate, as they all try to stay below four uh, percent, using below using using below four percent of the of the fund, although it isn't a law, it would become very difficult for government to go over this because parts of not all parts of society, but some parts of society would protest quite a lot if they spent more than 4%, if it's not an extreme crisis? I don't agree. I don't think that's no? the way it works. I think, I think it's much more flexible, but so far we have not been in a position in need of spending more, but we have the liberty to do it. Mm. And since the fund is growing, uh, we don't need to spend more because a growing fund, 4% is more every year. So we don't need to spend more than 4% and still we are spending more money. Okay, then you, and then Daniel has a question. Uh, Ole Gunnar talked about that is in some detail. There is uh, that uh, the government has direct ownership of oil in the ground. There is Statoil, which is a state-owned company, and there are different taxes on Shell and Exxon and these companies that are collected, I think, on a bi-monthly bi basis. So there is a continuous inflow of money to the fund from the oil sector, from the state, and from Statoil. And the, and, and, and the cleverness is that, as Ole Gunnar said, is that uh, the government takes 78% of the super profit. You have other taxes? 
Ага. А. Работа. А, э, ну, то есть, э, если я правильно поняла, вот я вот еще уточнить хочу. То есть вы сказали, 78 процентов, да, берется вот от, ну, условно говоря, то, что касается от использования метод, да, вот этот вот, вот эта вот прибыль, да, она кладется в основу э, доходной части бюджета Норвегии. Или я неправильно поняла? Да, и ну еще такие. Uh, the, the biggest tax collector, I think, is value-added tax, which is uh, 25%. It's a high value-added tax in Norway. So, and then there are all the taxes that you have in other countries. So, so, so the oil tax is not that important compared to all the revenues that the government is uh, collecting. And uh, when you say that, if, 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 it, if you pay if you pay uh, uh, $20 to extract one barrel and you sell it for 120, then there is a super profit of 100. And out of these, the government takes 78. And that is, uh, so, so some, every now and then oil companies say that we don't want to drill in Norway because the taxes are too high. And then they drill after all. And that tells me that the tax regime is very good because you threaten to go out, but you stay. So the government has been very clever in extracting the bulk of the profit. Yes. But it's important to remember that the oil tax is only a little part of the total tax take. Only a little part of the total tax take. But that is a special part because it goes into the fund. Okay. That is a very good question and a very difficult question. And uh, I don't feel competent to give you a good answer. And that, my friend, is a good answer. <laughs> Turn next and then over there. Uh, if you look at the uh, annual hours being uh, worked in Norway, I think we are close to the four-day week already, because we work about 1,400 hours a year. In America, 1,800 or something like that. In Russia, I don't know, in Iceland, 1900 or something but we don't take it out in terms of in terms of four day week we take it out in terms of longer vacations and shorter labor day, shorter days in in the office uh, 
uh, but it is a general issue how should you divide between increased consumption and increased leisure and uh, we have opted to a great extent for increased leisure and uh, I think we would have done along the same line without oil but we can afford a little bit more that is correct Yes, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, like in any other country, if you look at the European Union, they have something called the Euro, and the Euro is a common currency. And the Euro has a rule that says that the deficit should not exceed 3% of GDP. That is their fiscal rule. Are you familiar with that? So that uh, in Europe they have a different fiscal rule, and they break it every now and then, and now France has said it needs five or three more years to meet the rule. So a rule is not a binding thing in Euroland, it's not a binding thing in Norway. But the rule is totally different in Norway because it's based upon the oil fund uh, that has a rule, and sometimes in the future, I guess it will be exceeded, and now there is going to be a discussion, should it be 3% because the return is not being so big in the future because of low interest rates? And uh, that is why I'm saying this is a continuous discussion, and every year we uh, look at what does it take to balance the budget, and it should stay within those rules. So I. I think that the importance is not whether it's 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 percent, but the importance is that this is parliament has decided and they stick to their guns. All parties agree, and one party was against it, now they have the Minister of Finance. And when the Minister of Finance enter into that department or that ministry, there are very clever civil servants that easily or cleverly or whatever you like to call it, make the Ministry of Finance behave according to a continuum. There is no big change, even if the politicians do change. Okay. Do we have... No? I, I'm, uh, uh, this group of people are extremely good at posing questions, yes. but it looks like... We have managed to exhaust them, finally. <laughs> um, you've shown a lot of stamina, though, I must say. I thought maybe I would just add a point, uh, uh, or just s say one thing which I think is interesting from a Russian perspective, which won't be so relevant for the presentations tomorrow, but it's more relevant for, for um, uh, the two last presentations today, which is it's interesting. The, so to make it clear again what has been said, Norwegian the tax on the profits of oil companies is 78%. In addition, we have a large and uh, very dominant, probably uh, almost as dominant as Statoil or Rosneft, a state oil company, which is uh, about, I think it's 67% state controlled at the moment, something like this. Um, so about 23% privatized, which is more of a, uh, it's a mechanism to control the management more than anything else through the, uh, the stock value. And then, in addition, we have this very strange thing, which is the state direct, what you could state direct financial engagement or investment in the petroleum sector, which is a bit like the state oil company, just that it isn't, a f it, it isn't an oil company. It's just a small financial unit which invests in oil fields and owns parts of oil fields, but never takes on uh, operator responsibility and doesn't have very much technical competence. They just invest and then take profits from the oil field. So you have the, the very high tax level, big state oil company, and in addition this thing. 
and then in addition, you have all the things which they denied a little bit yes, uh, yesterday, um, all the income from the supply industry and employment, and the taxes on the supply industry and employment, which are, I think, often uh, underestimated by Norwegian economists and by Norwegian society in terms of our dependency on oil. But at least we have this incredible, this uh, many channels of income from uh, the petroleum sector and very high state involvement. And I think that should be interesting because if, if you're in the Russian petroleum sector and if a British uh, oil man or economist talks to you, they will say the problem in Russia is that the state is too much involved. The state is meddling and so on. Uh, but if you look at Norway, the state is at least as much involved as in Russia. So what is the difference? And why does it work much better in, Russia, in Norway than in Russia? And why don't the British come and criticize us or the Americans? And I think there's one reason, and it's predictability. No sudden moves. Predictability. Before you do something, you give a warning, you wait a few years, and you move slowly step by step. And you don't mix politics, personal relations, and the business of the petroleum sector. So there are no, you know, if the, if the prime minister doesn't like the head of an oil company or something, it, it doesn't get involved in uh, politics, which increases predictability. And I think that's, it's not uh, our main topic, but it's maybe an interesting kind of a difference uh, between the two countries. Um, I assume we have no more questions. Thank you very much and thank you very much.